All right, everybody, welcome back to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. My name's Ollie. It's not Sean. He's not here this week, but you're kind of used to that by now. That's just kind of a thing. He's always traveling, doing something. But you've just got me today, and uh, I'll, I'll finish the rest of the spiel. This show is brought to you by all the clothes of Vanilla Soft Company. Now, uh, we would normally start by, so Ollie, tell me about today's guest, and then I would ramble into it. But you can probably already see it's Leslie Vanessa, and uh, I have the pleasure of meeting her for the first time right now. So I, she's one of those people that, I'm sure that you've seen a bunch of these people as well. You know the face, you know the name, you've never talked. You see them all the time on social media and you think, I know them. And then, oh yeah, I actually haven't actually talked to them ever. And this is the first time. So, um, so welcome to the show, Leslie. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing great. Should I, I play the co-host part? Ollie, tell me about our guest today. (laughs) Well, um, I don't know that much about her, but I'm kidding. So, so you're, um, among many things, um, a fractional sales leader, which to be honest, I've heard of CMO and CFO. I haven't actually ever seen sales leader before in that sense. Is, Is that rare or not? Um, I think it's becoming a lot more common, but it is, it is newer. Um, so you're, you're not wrong there. Um, I'm really lucky to be in a couple of communities of fractional leaders. So I, I think I get a little bit more exposure to the fractional, like revenue leader, um, cohort than, than the average, the average Joe or Jane. But yeah, it's, there's a growing contingent of us. And I anticipate with an eye on the recession that companies will be, you know, extra keen to access a caliber of talent that they could not afford to have in-house full-time. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. And with all the benefits and all of the other things that come with it, it's not just a person. It's, you know, healthcare and loads and loads and loads of things and the bonusing and all that stuff. I imagine that's a good part of it. I've been in agencies before and that's kind of the same thing. It's we don't want to have to hire all these people and do all these things. It's a lot of work. We're not at the stage. So you come in do the job same way but um cool all right so take us back to the start then i know you've been doing this for a few years but um what what started what gave you the moment to say you know what i'm gonna do this full time let's do it yeah so i'm like a pretty new full-time entrepreneur um i just left corporate uh last january so january 2022 i'd been growing the business um on the side for about four years before that Um, And it started because I joined a startup as employee number one, just an insane choice uh, in in hindsight. Uh, But I was responsible for creating and launching the MVP, creating the entire go to market. And it was um, an incredible, but obviously uh, utterly exhausting stint. And when I was getting ready to leave that organization, I sort of thought to myself, I mean, if I can do this for somebody else with somebody else's idea and product in a saturated market, I surely can do it for myself. So um, decided to create Sales Team Builder. Frankly, didn't have a clear direction for it. I was doing a lot of like sort of mentoring for free and kind of speaking for free, donating a lot of time through the brand. Um, And Ollie, I, I, I can't say I really ever pictured myself becoming a full-time entrepreneur, but the business kept growing and growing. I think there is, uh, you know, as I mentioned, a, a growing appetite for fractional sales leadership. And I also think that during the pandemic, there was a much bigger appetite for remote support. So my, you know, my total addressable market exploded I didn't have a lot else to do. So I really doubled down on, on the business um, while, you know, still working my, my full-time day job. Um, and it, it got to the point where my, my mentor said to me, so it was like two years ago, I was applying for jobs and I was not enjoying the process. And he said to me, do you think it's a bigger risk to put all of your eggs in one basket and work for one company that can fire you any day of the week for no reason? Or do you think it's a bigger risk to bet on yourself and be in complete control of the product, me, and be able to spread that risk over multiple clients? Um, and frankly, it was the, the first time I ever really thought about it in, in that kind of black and, and white lens. And it became a pretty easy decision after that for me to leave corporate and bet on myself. So that's why we're different. Um, in COVID, I did a lot of this. 
<laughs> uh, for the audio listeners, this is my PlayStation controller. Uh, you started doing your own business. <laughs> I wish I'd have had the impetus. Um, okay, so I, I thought you'd been doing it a couple of years longer than that, but but now when you explain it that way, I see uh, it looked like to me at least the impression I had you were full time for about four or five years. But that's you've been doing it. So what was your incentive to do it for you personally? Obviously, um, you had time, you wanted to, but I mean, if I was to start my own side company now, it would be financial and also i'd have to have kind of a passion project element to it i couldn't just you know work an extra five hours a day and be okay with that i'd get tired only then would i be all right so what kind of motivation did you have to do it yeah it it surely did start as that passion project um and it was really from a place of my experiences as a woman in sales and so when i think about the mentoring i was doing and the speaking i was doing um, it it was very much to help transform sales into a more inclusive profession, into a more respected profession. Um, so uh, like a love of sales as a profession, but also an honesty that it's been a, a pretty rough road for me in terms of harassment and discrimination and, um, you know, all of all of that jazz. That's a fairly common story for for women in sales, not just me. Um, and when I was thinking about doing it full time, becoming a full time founder instead of just working two jobs, <laughs> uh, just two. yeah, just, just casually, casually two, And maybe a third is like a content creator. Um, what really got me excited was the opportunity to make an impact in a lot of businesses instead of just one. Like I, I knew that I clearly had the ability to, you know, to make an impact within one organization. I'd done it for 15 years. I'd been a head of sales three times. Um, but, but bringing that sort of buyer centric mentality into multiple businesses, rooting their sales practices, particularly like their cold outreach, cold outbound sales practices in a, um, respect for the lived experience of the sales rep. And giving some space to connect with customers in maybe a new, more creative, more meaningful way. Um, It was that that was like a a, to your point, like that was really exciting. That was something that made me want to get up in the morning and do the work. So something you said a moment ago, I'm trying to picture the storyline here. So you started doing this on the side and you're mentoring, doing talks and those things. And that's kind of out of, you know, goodness of your heart for for people who want to be helped and that kind of stuff, learn, develop, and also your, your passion toward just the market that you're serving. That's like free stuff that you're doing. It could be going on a podcast, could be doing a talk for a group. When does it become paid to do a gig or, or was that one of the other things that you were doing at the time? Was it consulting plus some of those things to build your name and brand? Yeah, really organic growth. So at first it was like, I, I wasn't looking for money. I mean, I had like a big tech sales job. I was making all the money I felt like I I needed to make. So um, at at first, I certainly started the company just to have the brand sort of as a like a just in case a fail safe. I've had the brand, I'm growing it. It's it's there as I I need it. Um, and, And what happened very organically is that I started getting inbound leads, people wanting to hire me. Um, and that really ramped up, um, in 2000, um, 21, two, two years ago. Yeah. Like two years ago when I started at my TikTok channel at sales tips talk, and I was like very much an early adopter of TikTok, really from a, like a B2B sales tips perspective. I was the first person that was doing it. Other people were kind of talking about how to break into tech sales, but nobody was talking about how to do B2B sales. So that gave me an incredible inbound lead flow. Like it just, I, I mean, it blew me away. Um, so I started making the, you know, a lot of money, like in, uh, 2021, I, I build like 46 K just from inbound TikTok leads. From TikTok. Yeah. Which I always is feel like crazy, it's such right? like a weird fantasy land of do this. It will be great for your business. And everyone's like, yeah, okay, then I'll put some stuff on there and it'll get some likes. But I suppose it's different. Like if you're a company, it's, you know, you've got like multiple tracks to money, haven't you? 
Whereas if it's you and you provide the service and you're literally talking about it, it's kind of like B2C in the sense you look, you see, and you can buy it if you want to buy it. Absolutely. And I think there's something to TikTok that is not existent on LinkedIn, which is that feeling of closeness to me. Because you're hearing me say it, you're seeing, you're seeing me like there's a bit more credibility and authenticity where like anybody can kind of post whatever BS they want on LinkedIn and get away with it. Like we've all seen it, right? Like the person with one year of experience, but they have 30,000 followers and everybody thinks they're this B2B sales or marketing guru or whatever. And really they have literally no idea what they're talking about. Um, but if you're, you're doing it more in that like live video way, I, I just, I think that there is a default credibility and relatability built into that, that lent itself to creating this inbound lead flow for me. Um, and I, it was the end of 2021 and I had decided that I was, was not happy with the interview processes that I was in. There was just a lot of inherent like sexism and discrimination and like gender aside, just a, like a deep disrespect for sales as a profession, because I was interviewing with a lot of early stage founders who, you know, had closed like five clients themselves and thought suddenly they were a sales expert. And it's like, I don't know how to tell you this when all your closing are deals with your friends with complete control over pricing and the product roadmap. That's, that's not a replacement for like 15 years of somebody honing this as, as a craft. Um, and I got a job offer that I can only describe as what I thought was my dream job offer at the time. Like I'd spent my entire career pathing towards CRO. This was this like huge step as a 460 K job offer, which is a life changing amount of money. Like it would have been a huge pay, huge pay jump, jump for me, you know, like equity reporting to the CEO diverse board. Like this job checked all of my boxes. I got that on a Friday on Saturday. I won a deal with the, like the biggest deal that I'd won for sales team builder, um, woman owned business, queer woman owned business, like really exciting work. And it was really in that 24 hours that my path like crystallized so clearly because when I talked about the job, it was like, well, it, you know, it would be the right, like the responsible thing to do. It is what I've always said I wanted. And when I talked about the opportunity to partner with this, this company through sales team builder, I was like, oh my gosh, and we can work on this and we could do this. And it was just, it was so evident in the the way I felt and the way I was talking about the, the two different opportunities that I, I had to say yes to sales team builder and betting on myself. I can just see it in your face. You, you made the right choice. You're beaming when you talk about it. And that's like, it's a difficult moment because I think a lot of people, if they were in your, your shoes, you'd, you'd like to think they pick that as well. But so many wouldn't. And I think a lot of that's born out of like the, the, the mentality you kind of describe and called yourself out for. So if, if it was me, it would be, you know, I've just bought a house. So finances are pretty important to me. Uh, you know, I should probably take that. But I think it comes with like a bit of situation. So for instance, um, I've just bought a house. My savings are a bit down than they used to be, obviously. Um, then, then it's a bigger risk depending on how much money I'm going to make doing the new thing I want to do. So like how big a drop off or, or was it not really a drop off? Was that big dream job to where you, where you are roughly and where you were heading in the kind of near future? Cause it, cause that, that's a really big difference. If you've got no savings to back you up and if it's a massive drop. Yeah. Huge, huge, huge difference. Um, so I, I mean, I'm very lucky because I, I had built myself quite a runway where I could have very literally made no money last year. And I, I would have been okay. I mean, I would have had to have a hard look in the mirror at the end of the year and been like, you're not cut out for this, go back and get a job. Um, but it's, you know, it, it was very scary. I don't want to pretend like I made the leap without hesitation or fear or doubt, I experienced all of, all of those things. Um, and, and, you know, had to make the leap despite that I had, you know, before I, I, I moved over, I had done all the budgeting. Like I knew it was going to be a dramatically different lifestyle on paper. I don't think I realized like emotionally, mentally, how much different it was going to be for me to have to be like, 
I can't afford that. Sorry, I can't join. I can't do that thing. Um, that was, that's been a, a pretty big shift for me. I, I mean, a, an amazing trade-off for like the mental health of being my own boss and the freedom. And like, it's a trade-off I'm, I'm grateful that I made. Um, but it, it was an adjustment to be able to do whatever I wanted because I was making so much money to be like, I can't do any of that. Thank you. Um, and I think also a bit of an adjustment, Ollie, to, and like, I already had like, you know, my entire tech stack set up. Like when I went full-time founder, like I had existing clients, I had testimonials, I had a tech stack set up so I could hit the ground running with very few people that just like one day decide to leave corporate and become an entrepreneur. Like they don't, you know, they don't have that foundation. Um, but my goal for year one was to become a six figure agency. Fine. Great. Like did, did that, did that like smashed that, smashed that goal. Um, and then my goal for this year is to double that. And even if I double that, which is, it's feasible. I feel confident I'm going to do it. I'm still not even close to replacing my salary. So it's, it's one of those things where I know the long-term potential and the long-term upside financially is, is so significant. It's more than I could really ever make, even in like a, a, the best of tech jobs. But it's like a three to five year ramp. And I, in conversations with other folks that are thinking about leaving corporate or have recently left corporate, I, I so often see just like a true lack of understanding of what, like how much effort it takes to ramp, how much time it takes to ramp. Even, even if you are ramped to the point that you're like getting consistent clients and hitting goals, like what it will take to replace where you were, if you, you know, came out of a, a tech sales job. So um, all worth it. I don't want to scare people away, but I would really encourage people to like sit down and have some of those honest conversations with themselves about what it means financially, mentally, emotionally before they just say like, you know, screw you, screw you, screw you. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I know what you mean on, on a slightly lesser scale. I've just started a YouTube channel and it's like, you have to upload a certain amount, which takes you a couple of working months worth of hours outside of your working hours, outside of sleeping and having fun before you can even know if you've done it wrong. And that's yeah. like point zero 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 one before you can even get to one before, you know, God knows how long later you might maybe make it and make 20 bucks a month. And you're like, wow, this is really long, but you know, that that's part of it. So I, I respect anybody who's done it. It's, you know, making their own business or however they're going to do it. When you take your own pay into it and you just say i'm gonna leave my job what a massive massive step that is and what a and i'm glad that you had so much runway because a lot of people they um i've heard of a lot less and that terrifies me i'm quite risk averse with my money and that that oh god my heart rate so um so kudos for doing that so you you hit six figures you want to double that what's different between now and what you were doing last year? Are there new things you're doing? Are you trying to take more clients, raise price, something else, all of the above? Yeah. Um, so last year I spent a lot of time creating assets and now I have them. So that's a huge, I mean, like to your point about the YouTube channel, like that process of creation is hugely time consuming. Um, and that's true for like, I'm, I'm really well known for an interactive coaching workshop series I do. And so I built out a ton of additional trainings and decks so that that was more robust and I could meet the needs of, of more clients. But that stuff takes a really long time, um, maybe longer for me because I do still struggle with a bit of perfectionism. I'm very much like an oversell so I can under undersell so I can over deliver um, sort of sort of person. Um, so, I, I mean, I think a huge part of what took so much time last year was creating things and still like figuring, figuring some of where I wanted to take the business out. Um, I, I gave myself a lot of permission in year one of the business to say yes to anything that sparked interest. Like, sure, I'll try that. Like we can partner on that. Um, so that I could look back at the end of year one and be like, what did I love doing the most? Where did I deliver the most impact? Where did my clients see the greatest ROI? Um, and then have a lot more clarity in my focus going forward. 
So I, like, I, I think all those things add up. I simply will have more time because I will get to spend less time creating those foundational assets. And I have a lot more clarity in what I'm going to say yes to and what I'm going to say no to. And, and, you know, that's certainly a time saver in and of, its, of itself. And like, I can increase my prices now because I have a bunch of additional testimonials and I have, you know, all of, all of this work and all of these assets to be able to show to clients. So a little bit of everything, increasing price, increasing margins, increased clarity in the direction I'm going. Okay. So all I can think of when I hear that is, no reason why it doesn't go to half a mil. Oh, I I'll say it. Rich. What that about, be, um, so after bad. this year, let, let's say you do double your target and you hit it. Then what? So I, I, I'm not expecting like the 50 year plan here because no one knows, you know, maybe on 12 months, realistically, it could all change. But have you thought of, you know, I want to hire and then that's my way of expanding or no, I never want to hire and I want to have even more streams of income, which will then exponentially sort of rising boat uh rising tide lifts all boats i think is the yeah. phrase i'm going for yeah like, what, um, what's your like a longer terms sort of ideology about it yeah so very intentionally not hiring like very intentionally remaining a company a month one remaining a, a solopreneur um which that like that was something i really struggled with in the first days of becoming a full-time founder, I feel like it's the equivalent of like the moment you get married, everybody's like, when are you guys going to start a family? The moment you become a full-time founder, when are you going to scale? Um, and it's this default assumption. And I, I, I had one of my mentors recommended a book to me called the uh, company of one by Paul Jarvis that I read, you know, right after leaving corporate. And it was uh, so refreshing to have an alternate narrative. And the kind of premise of the book is that bigger isn't always better. But having come out of that like startup world, out of that like, you know, SaaS world, it was always like scale, scale, scale to the moon, next round of funding. Um, and I realized that the the reason that I wanted to become my own boss was for freedom. And once you decide to hire employees, you are taking on an incredible, at least in my estimation, an incredible amount of responsibility for their well-being, and that's a, like that's a lot. And I don't want to do that. Um, so I work with a lot of freelancers, um, which is is great, so that I can you know at least sort of outsource some of those like admin tasks or low value tasks. Um, but the, I think the path forward is partnership for me finding new revenue streams, additional revenue streams, diversifying my income, um, creating more passive income streams for myself, which is something that's really high on my list this year. Um, so I want to I want to scale. I want to scale margins. I want to scale revenue. I want to scale impact. I do not want to scale my human resources in the terms of FTEs. I like it. Not many people say that. And uh, I've read... I don't remember the name of the book. Um, it's years ago now. It might, it might have been oversubscribed. I can't remember who that's by. But their, their whole idea was like a course-ran business. You have a cohort of people, you put them through, and in the back end, you're backfilling the next cohort and the one after that. And you only ever have a certain amount of people going through. So you have 50 clients, but you've already got 60 ready because you've got 50 and 10 for the one after that. And you never have any more people than I think it was eight because after eight, you never really become more profitable is their ideology. And I, I did sit and think at the time, agency of three people. Oh, yeah. Like if we have to have middle managers to cope with the next six people, realistically, how much better is that? So kudos. I've not really heard too many people, especially on this podcast, talk about it. It's nearly always, yeah, I need to build a software. So I've got to hire a developer. And that I get. Can't really outsource that on the freelance way. Potentially you could, but but the way you're doing it... um. Love it. And uh, and with that, Leslie, sadly, like I've got to watch the clock. I hate this about my job here. I always have to say that's the end of the episode. But before you go, um, one quick question. How do you self-educate? You courses, are you trial and error, books, something else? Ooh, I love this question because I am huge on not just self-educating, but the more important piece, which is actually taking what I've learned 
testing it, figuring out if it works for me, if it doesn't, iterating. And I think that that's the piece that most people miss. We consume, consume, consume and never use. Um, I love books. I run a monthly business book club on Patreon. I love books so much. Um, I also love masterclass. I think they're fire. I'm in Malcolm Gladwell's masterclass right now. And like the amount of notes I write, the, the man is just like, so smart. So a lot of books, a lot of podcasts, um, uh, masterclass I absolutely love. And, you know, say what you will about LinkedIn. I, I still find a lot of what my community shares to be thought provoking and, and valuable. So I still find that to be a good source of information. All right. And with that, um, where can people find you and follow you, find out more about what you do? Yeah. LinkedIn for sure. I'm there under my name, Leslie Benetz. Um, TikTok, if you prefer video at sales, tips talk and if you're interested in the book club just search business book club on patreon all right good stuff great episode thanks very much for coming on i appreciate it and with that everyone that is the end i'm sure you guessed that by now but before you drop make sure you leave a subscribe or a like or a follow whatever platform you're on i don't know that's up to you and um we'll see you on the next one thanks for listening thanks ollie